welcome to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from, and the businesses, and more importantly, the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Welcome to the podcast and uh, a bit of a different episode this week that demonstrates for me how broad a topic can be explored under the hospitality umbrella. Regular listeners will know that I think we have a responsibility if we work in the world of food and drink to try and have a positive impact on the environmental footprint of our industry. And when I say our industry, it is in fact much broader than that, of course, because all humans eat and drink every single day, and the food we choose has the biggest environmental impact of all, much more so than transport and energy. But it can be a complicated subject. Should we only buy local produce? Well, no, not really. One, because if we did, I could not drink coffee, and without coffee, what on earth is the point? Okay, I'm kidding. But actually, even buying local is complicated. Whilst we probably can technically live on what is grown locally, it's pretty unrealistic. And let's say if you just take the humble tomato, are you better off growing it under heated glass in the UK or shipping it up on a truck from Spain, where growing conditions are so much more favourable? Is it realistic to always grow produce in sodden UK soil during the winter, being compacted by machinery, destroying its ecology? Probably not. However, we can clearly do better than we are. Sometimes huge monoculture farms may be doing a great job of trying to provide cheap food to feed the world. However, would they be better off just trying to feed the local village or two? Would that be a better form of farming? Clearly, we are pouring chemicals and fertilizers onto our land, destroying biodiversity. Seeing these chemicals wash into the rivers and the oceans with detrimental impact on wildlife and the wider food chain. It's not sustainable and lots of people are waking up to this and becoming interested not just in joining the hospitality industry in selling better food to people but in actually producing better food too. Smaller scale farming, looking to regenerate the land and provide a home for wildlife and to capture carbon in the soil and to improve its bacteria and its richness, directly improving the nutritional quality of the food that we grow. But there's a problem. Land is scarce, or at least affordable land is scarce. Farmland may be passed on generation to generation, or the soil may be too degraded to farm, or only short-term leases may be available, discouraging investment over the time period required to really regenerate the land and to create a viable business. So why am I telling you all this? Well, we're going to explore these issues with today's guest, Zoe Wangler from the Ecological Land Cooperative. They're a charity trying to solve some of these problems with very real and immediate impact. They want to see a living, working countryside where land is valued as a way to enhance the good of community, countryside and the natural world, revitalising our rural economies. They want to see low impact, land based livelihoods flourish. The stewardship of land to create healthful, wholesome and ecologically sound food and land based products that benefit people and the biosphere. And they do this in a number of ways. It starts with buying some land and finding stewards who want to set up their own business on it. They help swell the cost of this land over a number of years and they help the new stewards with planning to actually be allowed to live on the land whilst they regenerate and farm it. I think it's a great charity. Not only does it have great aspirations, but it already has a number of successful farms up and running and is actually making a difference. But it's still early days and so much more can be done. 
And I hope some of you listening to this conversation will be inspired to want to set up your own small scale business on a piece of land. But many of you will want to support the incredible work this charity does. And that even more of you will think about where you are buying your food and where you can support a local veg box scheme. Okay, just before you go, a couple of quick things. Zoe and I talk about a few films that have inspired us or a few websites with useful information during this conversation. And every week I include any links that are discussed in the show notes on the website humansofhospitality.co.uk. But even easier than remembering to go onto the website every single week is that I email you once per week with the details of that week's guests with all of the links easily accessible in your inbox. I don't share your details with anyone else and I only send you one email a week on a Monday morning. If you'd like to get that email please sign up on the website. It's super easy. You'll find the box to pop your details in at the bottom of the home page. And whilst you're on the website there are also a couple of big buttons. One says Patreon and the other one says PayPal. Via either of those, you can make a donation to keep this podcast on the air. Now, it's a pretty time-consuming process, keeping this going every single week, and I love it, but the financial help in paying for the kit or the hosting or the editing or the travelling is exceptionally helpful. Right, thank you. Let's go and meet Zoe. Oh, final thing. We did record this outside my hotel on the terrace on a pretty wild and windy day, so there is a bit of background noise. My apologies. It was also during a Sunday morning service, so you can hear the comings and goings of a few guests. Sorry for the distraction, but hopefully you enjoy the atmosphere. Over to Zoe. Zoe Wangler, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today on a slightly wet and wild uh, day in Bournemouth. Uh, can you just explain? Uh, normally, I, I go and meet people wherever they are in the world, but I'm going to throw it over because I happen to know where we are. But where are we for people listening? Morning. Zoe? Uh, this is the first time I've been to your restaurant in. Uh, can I say Bournemouth? You Would can. that be right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just joining you for a coffee at your yeah. at your restaurant here in Bournemouth. Thanks for coming. Thanks for trekking. What brings you to Bournemouth? You're down visiting friends. Where, where do you live normally? I live in Lewis, and ah, nice. I brought my 13 year old boy to uh, visit our friends Excellent. in Wimborne and spend a few days with another child yeah. and her mum. Good, and we grabbed the opportunity because I'd randomly been in touch, uh, hoping to chat with you anyway, and uh, the fact you were involved was too good for true. So thank, thank you for saving me the travel, although I love Lewis. It's a nice part of the world, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Famous for the uh, November the 5th, isn't it? The bonfire night and stuff. Not happening this year, I think. Not, not happening this year. <laughs> no, that's a shame, isn't it? My kids were gutted. They were gutted yesterday that Halloween oh. was rubbish because my daughter loves sweets, and uh, that's all that Halloween is to her. Did and she now dress up? Uh, no, we were on our way back. We were in St. Ives for a few days, actually, so we were on our way back. She did watch uh, Strictly last night, which is, I don't know if they did it Halloween-themed. but uh. Right, so you are uh, e- Ecological Land Cooperative, which I'm really pleased gets gets abbreviated to ELC, because it's actually quite hard to say over and over again, isn't it? It's, it makes perfect sense as a name, but uh, yeah, you, and you, you're you one of the co-founders. You were the director for a period of time. Um, you're now working on a project with the Land Workers Alliance, and you are the policy campaigner. Is that a fair introduction Zoe that'll do yeah happy with that and yeah. and so from now on ELC is ecological land cooperative couldn't you have got agree. something that rolled know, off the tongue a little I bit know, easier all through these years we've we've uh we've reflected on that and wondered if we could have done better yeah it's funny isn't it? it's only three words it shouldn't be that hard to say really is it but it but it does seem to be a little bit so um this is a charity and and I'm really you know genuinely excited to chat to you, I, I am pretty much with all of my guests, but this is something that I really uh, passionately believe in, I suppose, is, is is getting back to the soil and where our food comes from. So I interviewed a chap called uh, Tom Foote from the Open Air Dairy. Have you heard of those guys? Not the Open Air Dairy. Just go and have a listen to that one. You'll enjoy it. Guy Singh Watson, who we were just chatting about from yeah. Riverford. Um, Andrew Parry Norton is a, a commoner in the New Forest. Have you heard of commoners? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not in a negative way. It doesn't in a mean very positive well. way. Yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah, so I had a great chat with him uh, on the podcast, and he took me out and showed me his land out in the forest and stuff. So, so it's something that I feel passionately uh, about and, and yeah, really looking forward um, to chatting to you. So can you just explain a little bit? It was founded in 2009. Why do you exist? Where did this come from? Oh, thanks for, for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. I had, I had been part of an envir- environmental campaigns, primarily the anti-roads movement, but I, I didn't feel comfortable just talking about what was wrong. I wanted to see what was, what, what was right, what were the solutions, and that took me to different projects across the UK, including the Central Alternative Technology um, and also 
for people who are doing educational projects on organic farms. And I thought, this is, this is good, we want more of these things. And I looked at why we weren't seeing more of them. And I could see that land was, was pretty much the, the primary reason. It's very expensive and there's not much of it for sale. So when I saw an idea that had been floated by a group of people that I'd actually been campaigning with, which was for us to bring together community money and buy land and then make that land available to really good projects. I thought, yeah, I really want to be part of this. And um, when we first set up, we said, well, let's just focus, first of all, on making that land available for small scale growers. Um, and then in time, we'll do some other projects too, maybe environmental education centres or uh, natural well-being centres. But we found that it's been such a steep learning curve to, uh, yeah, the process of, of raising money, acquiring land, um, planning, getting the planning consent, working out the relationships with our, well, what we call our stewards, which are the people that go on and, and work the land. And uh, just being the, 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 we're a cooperative, being the, the cooperative we want to be in terms of um, our values. And yeah, all of that has just, has just, has meant that we've just stayed with producing what, small holdings for new entrants to to organic and biodynamic farming yeah i think that's enough having read about what you've done and your website's really comprehensive by the way so you've got loads of information on there and all the advice to, to uh, your stewards tenants what do you call them again i'm going to keep stewards, getting them the wrong stewards yeah. i'll try and get the right uh, right terminology um but it's funny i think how ambitious we can be sometimes isn't it and and think we're going to you know achieve all of this stuff but actually yes. just focus on one thing <laughs> and let's do it change the, yeah, yeah let's yeah, change yeah. the world which way you're doing it but it's got it's got to start somewhere and, and it is an incredibly complicated issue so i was reading that is it something like um one percent is it yeah so so half of the land in england is owned by just twenty five thousand people which is less than one percent of the pop of, of the population so this this is the kind of thing that you notice in the early days what's what's the problem that this was causing then what was it you're trying to solve i suppose or what was the problem you noticed so when it it would be different for different types of land-based businesses but let's just say with small-scale growers so say for example if you wanted to set up a, a, a a vegetable box scheme like you some people will be familiar with if you bought a bit of land then you wouldn't necessarily have very much money left anyway to invest in the infrastructure because land can, can already be quite expensive it's it's gone up to about ten thousand pounds an acre um, and just for the listeners who don't know if you're starting a vegetable box scheme you would probably want at least three acres so that's thirty thousand pounds then you've got your your infrastructure costs and then you've got to pay for your costs of living and then the first few years you won't make much of an income. I mean, they, the, the industry says around about five or six years it takes to really get yourself to a good place in terms of annual income. So where do you find all that finance? And on top of it, you've got to pay for your housing. So one of the solutions that we came up with was, well, if we buy land and ask for a special permission from the council to let our small-scale growers live on their land, at least they wouldn't have that cost as well. And that would make a big difference to their to their finances. So they could then just focus their capital on investing in the land and the infrastructure. And also the other thing that we did for them was to say, you don't have to pay us all that money at once. You can pay it for the land investment. You can pay us over 25 years. So yeah. that it becomes more like a mortgage for them and a much more manageable. Nonetheless, it's still really, really hard. Because how many people have that kind of that kind of capital to invest in in a business and then uh, in time after five years of being there they're allowed to build their own home they've got to invest in that mm. so it's it's still so that's that's a lovely thing to do to say i want to help somebody have a business but there'll be lots of people who want a business who can't afford to set up a business why particularly is this important why do why do we need people to get into yeah. small scale farming that is the question isn't it because you know you wouldn't want to just enable well you probably wouldn't feel excited and enable just any old business but not um, if they were mining oil or something exactly. or blowing up mountains no <laughs> so so yeah why why small scale farming <laughs> going back to that that question you asked about what you know why did you set up the co-op because i could in my experience of of staying on those farms and also i'd i'd worked as a researcher environmental researcher for a time and the, the what i was reading about the benefits environmental benefits of small scale farming so the work a few different reasons there the social reasons small-scale farms are more likely to be open to the public to have a relationship with their local community to be providing extra activities and just opportunities to engage with the land learn about the land learn about where food comes from 
sometimes they'd be running programs particularly addressing poverty locally um, so maybe they would bring in people who were struggling to make to make ends meet and they would say come and have a little bit of land and grow your food or you can take our excess or maybe we'll do a program to help you learn how to to cook with the food we produce each project would be a little bit different but they'd all have these social benefits that was what I saw and was also actually borne out in the research that I've come across since since I've been involved and then the environmental benefits so the small-scale farming that we support is without pesticides, without fertilisers, a lot of the farmers that we uh, allow on our land um, don't use minimum till or no till, which means that they're not ploughing up the soil every year, which means that the carbon that's in the soil stays there, the, the, the soil life that's in there stays there. So we see improvements in the soil quality and soil nutrients. And that has all knock-on effects in many different ways, aside from carbon, but also in, in things like reducing soil erosion, river pollution because you're getting less soil water runoff. They're likely to have more div a, a diverse range of crops in a smaller space. So you're increasing your biodiversity, they're more likely to put in more hedgerows and uh, more tree crops. So they're, they're just creating a lot more habitats for, for particularly for, for insects. Amazing. That's that's that, that's that's the per yeah an awesome answer. So so I come across this sort of terminology, I suppose, quite a lot, and and I don't know if it's easy to explain what these things are, but this sort of concept of regenerative regenerative farming, yeah, for example. Nice. Yeah. So what what does that mean, regenerative farming? So how yeah, that, and how does it compare, I suppose, to so, so let's call it? I was going to call it traditional farming, although there's an irony there, isn't there? Because regenerative farming probably was traditional farming. So should we say yeah, the, the comparison now with modern farming? So there's, there are a few. There's a few words going around as well, which mm, what was the other one? Acro e ecology or something. Or so there's agroecology. That's there's, the one. There's regenerative farming. There's permaculture. There's organic. There's biodynamic. Yes. Um, they're all slightly different things, but just going back to the regenerative, the regenerative is is saying rather than, I mean, it's particularly used for livestock uh, in livestock systems. So rather than having livestock on a small area where they're going to really demolish the the grass there. Um, they they move the, the cattle around so they're only in one spot for a period which means that the grass roots stay intact and so it, it helps keep the soil intact helps keep the soil carbon in, in the soil um, so as far as I understand regenerative is really used for, for livestock farming only when it comes to fruit and vegetable production we tend to use the term agroecology well in our, in our little sector anyway mm. and, and what's uh, that? And we think of that as as a system which doesn't have, like I was saying, doesn't have the pesticides and doesn't have the, per the fertilizers, uses min till, minimum till or no till and has this wide range of, of crops in the system. So it allows for, for biodiversity to, to coexist. Mm. Okay. All the And have you seen the? Um, I was chatting to someone about this a couple of days ago on another podcast. But the uh, the Netflix show about soil. Have you seen that? Yes. One? Uh, yes what's yes, it called? Yeah. Uh, Kiss the ground. Kiss the ground. It's awesome, isn't it? Wasn't it's it? fascinating. It's yeah. And, and 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 the opportunity for just how much carbon is actually locked up in our soil, and oh, the opportunity amazing. to improve that is is mind blowing, really, isn't it? So yeah, it's encourage people to go. It's and watch one it. of the few documentaries about the environment that i've seen for a while that that left me feeling very hopeful yeah and what's that? have you seen the biggest little farm i think it's called oh no have i you didn't seen see that? that one that's about a u.s a regenerative or, or yeah uh, restorative farm i guess well worth did going you, and finding did you, do you feel like there's a different definition of regenerative from those programs that you've watched? um yeah i think it's interesting i was one of my questions was going to be I, I find the the animal use i suppose fascinating uh, so this is this was going off on what could be an incredibly long tangent but you know as a restaurateur yeah. um uh, but also I, I personally follow a predominantly plant-based diet albeit that's a relatively recent thing um, but I find it complicated because actually on small-scale farming the opportunity to use animals to fertilize the land and to you know to kind of eat the grass and then to you know to, to soil the grass and to create this restorative farm um, is is fascinating so I haven't completely got my head around where the sweet point is I suppose particularly around yeah using or working with animals to restore the land so i wasn't i wasn't familiar with the agroecology and the restorative i suppose being being animal specific but um yeah in general i don't know i see all of this different terminology what i fundamentally love and and you know chatting to guy um from riverford about this was was you know how important soil is basically and, and i guess the bits that people don't really realize is not just 
you know, I, I, I see quotes of there being maybe sort of you know between 30 and 50 cycles of soil left b- before we've completely destroyed it and there's no nutrients left in it and it just seems utterly insane that we we artificially throw chemicals and fertilizers on the soil rather than just allowing it to restore itself and the fact that all those chemicals we throw on then wash off into the rivers you know we've got problems with with fish being uh, affected by this but also you know the plastics that end up in the ocean i just i just find the whole thing um yeah, I mean, it could be really depressing, like you say. And I, and I watched David Attenborough's show a couple of nights ago as well. His, uh, his what's he called it? Yeah, his testimony, which, which for the first half, you know, literally made me sob. But then loved his his optimism, I suppose, about the fact that it is possible to make a change. I've I've gotten off on a really long. So you, you could be interviewing me now. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole the whole thing is fascinating. What's clear though is that we need to understand it better and we can't ignore it and we need to do something about it and this this overconsumption this monoculture uh, kind of you know farming technique and i sympathize with the farmers because you know fundamentally they're trying to feed people you know and they're trying to feed people at a good price and they're trying to stay solvent and i think lots of farmers are good human beings who also do like the land and appreciate the land and they they've almost sort of been backed into this this destructive self-destructive corner whereby they they they've invested in huge amounts of kit and technology um to to grow uh, very efficiently and i think many of them are probably a little bit depressed themselves seeing the, the impact and the tiny little margins and how do they how do they get out of that god i've gone off on a tangent what do you think zoe <laughs> yeah there's a lot there isn't there it? is yeah I was gonna say, there's no specific question there but, uh... i was just as you were saying that i was just reflecting on um the experiences that we've had interacting with say for example the farmers that were on the mm. land before yeah. our stewards went on the land and sometimes we've we've really noticed that they felt criticized by us mm. um i'm really aware of that sensitive to that uh, because i i don't want to go in criticizing um you know and it, it didn't we didn't mean to go in and criticize but if we've done say for example an ecological survey and we found that there's no soil life and the soil is compacted from, uh, yeah, from years of maize production. Then, then that's the truth as well. Um, but also another truth is those farmers usually only get say one year tenancies. Well, how can they invest in doing something different in terms of production if they if they can't get a longer tenancy? Hmm. Yeah, what's their response generally? I suppose when you tell them how degraded their soil is, I suppose it's mixed. Is it just some of them go, "That's exactly the reason why we wanted you to have the land," or generally are they defensive of it? Or I think, I mean, we haven't had dozens of experiences. We've only had a handful of experiences, but in in those experiences, then then people feel they feel criticised, and um, you know, maybe their neighbours will come in defence and say, "Well, look, you know, he only had a year tenancy, and he he did what he, he could, and he did do this, and he did do that, and." And, you know, we're not accusing them or anything. We're just reporting on, on the findings of the ecological survey. But we can see that that, 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 that hits a nerve. Yeah. And you're, the findings of those surveys when you do them is literally a, a, a ground bereft of the, the bacteria and the worms and all of the things that Sadly. generally make amazing soil. Is, is that yeah. what you're finding? Yeah, yeah. And is that after multiple years of, say, monoculture? Or is it, is it, can this destruction be sort of, you know, over quite a short period of time? I mean, we've got quite limited experiences. We've only bought five... Um, five pieces of land mm. but yeah in our experience it's it's um it's from years of yeah. of conventional mainly arable where it's um you know machines come on and compact the soil yeah yeah you're and i hadn't thought about it and, and i suppose it makes perfect sense when you were saying the fact that you know people who do go into small-scale farming it takes multiple years really before they can get a return because actually investing in that in that soil and, and making it rich and fertile again you know you are relying on nature if you're not going to do it with chemicals it's going to take a little bit of time i guess isn't it to, to get healthy although soil does have this am- amazing ability to regenerate re- regenerate itself just with a little bit of love doesn't it <laughs> I think no you just got me uh, thinking <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> reflecting on all our stewards and how long it's you know they, they've all had different stories and you know it, it, it's such a small group of people for me to yeah. make generalizations but you know for sure We've seen some incredible recoveries of soil, and most notably, I would say, it's the steward that has been using the the no-till yeah. and also mineral salt minerals to um, add fertility to the soil. Okay, interesting. 
I can now nod in appreciation of knowing what all this stuff means, which I didn't know a year ago. And regular listeners know that I set up my own kitchen garden this year. And I last winter, uh, without even knowing that lockdown was coming, because I predominantly did it in lockdown. But luckily, once when the last lockdown hit, um, I happened to have you know loads of manure and and, and sort of soil rich compost ready to then wheelbarrow onto my garden and built some raised beds. And uh, I've been growing my own stuff, and I've just found it you know utterly fascinating albeit that most of my crop was then eaten by slugs and snails and <laughs> butterflies the and all that kind of stuff so it's me. so bloody frustrating <laughs> but it's been interesting anyway look, we're going to get into what you actually do in a second but so, so just to finish off then the creation of the charity uh, you, you saw this problem saw this opportunity uh, great to do that but but how on earth did you raise the cash to buy those first plots of land then who, who supported it well, we did a, a, what's called a community share offer, and right. they're not very well known, but some people might know them. For example, if people want to buy their local pub or post office that's about to go out of business, they can set up a, a cooperative, a community benefit society, and that's, in the eyes of the government, that's that's different to a regular business, so you can just sell shares to, to the community without needing to go through all the difficult um, due diligence that's expected. Legislative of, nonsense. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so that we raised, we we went out just with the concept to uh, uh, just a bunch of people that we thought might be interested, and uh, and sort of threw threw ourselves at them and saying, please support this. We actually didn't even have enough money the first time to buy the buy the first bit of land, and so then we went to a bank and we got a little bit more, and we just sort of like I think we just went from from loan to share offer to loan to share offer until eventually we proved enough proved the model enough to then be approached by some charitable foundations uh, who were happy to lend us at a very low interest rate uh, money to buy bits of land Amazing. and then also we've we've been really successful in in these community share offers yeah i've seen recently you've just done one i think you've raised half a million pounds or something i think yeah. it? so it's like a proper grown-up charity now no. yeah <laughs> scary but in those first days then because you, you were one of the co-founders how many of you were involved in setting this up uh, five or six okay yeah. just sort of passionate in, in all environmentalists or was there a sort of savvy businessman on there with a big checkbook or uh, i think i don't think any of us had any business experience at all no, no, that's not true. We had one one <laughs> person who had experience setting up cooperatives, but none of us really had any okay. any okay. strong business backgrounds. Yeah. Um, fortunately, early on, we did we did get a package of support that included a very good advisor who helped us with all our financial forecasting, and uh, he's still with us today as one of the directors. So Amazing. really happy to to nick him. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> So, so getting into what you actually do then, we, we know the problem you're trying to solve and the people you're trying to help. So the, the way you can do this is to basically to, to buy land and then to split it up into smaller bits and then to, to lease that to tenants. Is that the overall, yeah. of, you know, is that a reasonable summary? On very long leases, so they have security of tenure and with the right to build their own home right. after they've established the business so that that makes it a viable pros proposition okay so which was the first bit of land you bought then and how big was it um 20 acres in devon right and that was uh i mean i can talk most about that because that yeah. was that was the one that i was really heavily involved with when we bought the land we were told by the local farmers that it was never going to make <laughs> farm businesses and and even when we had we had to go to a public inquiry in the end to get our permission to allow our stewards to live on their land and even at the public inquiry, the council's agricultural assessor said, oh, no, you know, it's it's not going to be good enough to, to have farm business. And of course, now we have three farm businesses there that that are doing great. Does that mean it was cheap? How did you find this plot? You know, well, I, I think actually that one was probably around six or seven thousand pounds per acre. So that wasn't. That okay. was probably one and it was just advertised sites. for sale or you approached someone or it was just advertised for sale but that is you know you touch on something important in this story which is that it is not easy to find bits of land for sale and i mean it, it was being separated from an existing farm it wasn't considered to be very good quality i mean there's there's parts of this story that have haven't been so successful and some that have been successful and i feel like one part that is successful is that it was used as marginal including part that was really boggy and the, the, the people who manage it now have really turned it around so they've effectively reclaimed a bit of the land that was just pretty much bog mm. uh, by, by planting trees further up the slope so that yeah. that water was being taken up by the trees and then that, that bit of land lower down then becomes something that they can farm and that's become yeah. you know, part of their I love how it's all so interconnected, it's it brilliant is isn't also, it yeah. so what did the, the, the farmer that was selling it then what, what would it normally have gone for who did he think was going to buy it if it wasn't 
farmable land. Yeah, I think possibly that some another local farmer would have bought it just to use the top fields that weren't boggy that were being used for maize and and other arable crops. Right. Possibly. And and he just or maybe in an investment. You know, I, I know a lot of people buy land now, don't they, to invest in, which is a right. part of the problem. Yeah. And okay. then they rent it out to a local farmer, but they've got they've yeah. got their investment. Yeah, all part all part of the challenge, I suppose. Yeah. So so you uh, you acquire it. What was the time period? Because you you bought the land not knowing then that you were going to get permission for people to actually live on it and to farm it, but you knew that's what you wanted to achieve. What yeah. was the time frame between buying it and, and can you just talk about that process a it little bit? It was quite a few years. Was it? Um, so uh, once we bought the land, then we engaged a planning consultant but that was our first experience of engaging planning consultant we just chose really badly um and he he was a bit of a fraud okay don't 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 mention his name i'll get in trouble yeah. <laughs> uh, but that in itself you know it wasn't a bad experience in the end in the sense that it delayed us right. um but i actually you know had quite a nice experience in the in that i got him to come to a third party that he also respected and and talk it through with him and say you know you did this right. and this had this effect on us and he you know he did apologize and and uh you know compensate us for for that time that that we lost well he didn't compensate us for the time but he he uh, acknowledged and re- returned some of his fees okay but you know so it wasn't an entirely ugly experience yeah. and um, all good learning all these all these steps along the way so then i was like well i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a go myself excellent and uh and did the planning application, and um, and it turned out that I was just quite good at it, which right. is which is uh, was it was a happy coincidence. Yeah. Um, good at it because you needed the vision, or good at it because you're good at filling in pieces of paper and digging with it. I think a bit of both actually. I think I've always been someone that you know, if someone goes, "Oh God, that form," I yeah. say, "I'll take it." You know, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't I'd mind. I'd be rubbish forms. at that. I really yeah. would. <laughs> I sort of have a weird nerdish okay. uh, attraction oh, I'm so to grateful forms. for people like you who exist in the world. It's like my <laughs> finance team. I just so, so much gratitude and my solicitor because he sends me reams, reams of paperwork that he knows I'm never going to read. And I just oh, say, God. have you read this? I'm getting into trouble, actually. Now I've got somebody in the team who does read it because it bores the arse off me. So oh well done. Oh, my God, it's so... Some of them are awful, aren't they? Oh, so tedious. So, yeah, partly you you need to care about it. So mm. and you really need to get into the detail and explain why you're doing what you're doing and you're asking the permission in detail. And, and was this specifically around lodgings? Is that the aspect of it? Or is this... Yes, yeah. it was specifically on the residential side of it. Because right. you could farm the land anyway, yeah. but basically you, you, you need people to live on it to do this style of farming. They need to live there, basically, don't they? Yeah, and also because in terms of the viability, it's just it's just so challenging for people to be setting up their farm, coming and going all the time from the farm to local accommodation and paying for accommodation mm. you know obviously if they've got kids as well then it adds another layer of complexity and then there's the sustainability side of it like if you're having to drive all the time back and forth to the site right that's uh, not that's not yeah. helping so and, and, and councils are fundamentally skeptical about allowing yeah, dwellings because yeah. they're worried that somebody's going to come along and build a farmhouse so this is why you get temporary permission is it five years is that right this is proof of concept kind of time exactly. period is it Normally it's three years in planning right. uh, policies, but we ask for a longer period because agroecological farms take longer to establish, and it's a completely new business from better land. So normally, if you the, like the three-year permission was designed around, say, a conventional farmer who wanted to start up a smaller, uh, you know, maybe sheep operation and needed accommodation for the for the shepherd, but wouldn't necessarily need five years to establish that business. But ours is is more complex and yeah it takes right. longer for people to, to get that set up okay um so we um we yeah, we had uh, meetings with the parish council and they 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 kind of came on board i mean they were in support but with 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 some reservations and then the planning officer recommended approval but then we had these hilarious meetings with the planning committee um, at one point, the, uh, one of the committee members says, is there enough wind for, for solar photovoltaic? <laughs> you need is... a lot of wind for solar? That's <laughs> <laughs> to blow the clouds away, was it? <laughs> but you can imagine, you know, when, you're, when it's your first project and everything is hanging on it, you're like, yeah. how are you on the planning yeah, how, how do you have the opportunity to turn this down? It's scary sometimes. Yeah, it? I've exactly. been in those licensing and planning meetings myself. Yeah. Um, it's so good you they... can laugh about it now, Zoe. I imagine oh, at the time yeah. you were weeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure, and then also all the the neighbours' comments that weren't supportive. They're really they're really upsetting, right? You know, and it feels like they try and find every reason to make yeah. you wrong, and um, and you think, well, all I'm trying to do is 
all we're trying to do here is set up three starter yeah, farms. Like, yeah, how is this so make awful? The world better. Yeah, scary. And okay. um, so, yeah, and then we also we uh, we filmed one of the planning committee meetings, and we got threats from the council that we were in breach or something or other. And we had to get we got a human rights law wow. firm to write a letter saying, awesome. Love <laughs> it. actually, it's okay. You're allowed to film public public meetings and. And anyway, so there's lots of uh, shenanigans around that time. And we got turned down by the planning committee and then we went to appeal. So all of this, you know, months and months passed. And um, again, the public inquiry was, you know, very tense, but also quite a fun moment to look back on. And we had so many people sat on to the bar side of the hall in the public inquiry, the planning inspector sitting at the front. Uh, and um, a couple of people sitting on the council's side, including one very grumpy member of the planning committee who was appalled that any of this was happening and all that this, all their money was being spent. I mean, their choice, obviously, but mm. they spent £20,000 on this public inquiry, which obviously wow. could have been spent somewhere mm. else. Mm. Not their money, though, is it? Public's money. Public's they money. were spending the public's money yeah, doing something arguably anti-public, but anyway, let's not go there. So so how long, what, what was the time period to, to from... from sort of buying the land to getting the permission it was probably about two and a half years wow i have yeah. to i'd have to go back and look yeah, but it, yeah, it was no, a fair old period yeah, yeah, of time, time. Yeah. but um so how did you eventually get permission what was was there a particular thing that kind of tipped the balance in your favor so or we, just persistence no we, this public inquiry we um we presented our evidence over a three-day inquiry to the planning inspector uh jessica graham Obviously, still remember her name fondly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what she thinks now. I was going to say that. Was I, was, I was waiting. For, that's going to be my question. But go I on. I don't think it. you get to contact them after. Do you not? So she I'm, hasn't come and, and and I don't know bought no. a lovely bit of radish and gone. You're awesome, Zoe. I'm so sorry. This is amazing. I'm going to follow up and ask her. Yeah. Um, and so we had these three days, and we had a great team. We had uh, a soil scientist, well, a soil advisor from the um, Organic Research Centre who has been involved in organic farming for years and years and years. We had um, one of our directors who was an expert on sustainability and sustainable living. We had um, one of our prospective stewards, who actually um, is not a steward now, but is an author, Sean Chamberlain, um, who writes on, on sustainability. And... Uh, and, and others, um, people from the Land Workers Alliance, which is this um, this small union for small scale farmers and foresters, and uh, it was just it was a really it was really a very fun, lively experience despite everything being on the line. Really. And afterwards, you know, you have to wait for a few months before you get your answer. But no. afterwards, wow. I just had a feeling. I just remember heading home and having to pass through London and sitting on the tube and just having a giggle, just feeling like. That went so well. Amazing. Um, I mean, we had our moment where it didn't go well for a few hours, but but generally it went really well. Okay. And then because they were the trying answer. to argue numerous things, including just the fact that it was unfarmable land and you couldn't use the soil anyway, but you had people on your side saying, "No, it is possible." Yeah. And arguing all of the sustainability arguments you know, that we need to transition to to a different type of farming. We need to provide opportunities and you know, all the issues around the council farms being sold off. So mm. where, are, where are the opportunities for new entrants to farming, mm. to enter farming, and this is what we're providing. Mm. And did, did, did the council look like, all the people on the planning committee, did they look like they were genuinely interested in learning or did they just look irritated about the fact that you had all these great arguments? Because you think, you think in some ways, you know, that's a good, that's a good process yeah, I mean, to go through, to, to, to gather all that evidence and demonstrate it. You'd like to think that they would watch that, learn, and go, oh, I mean, fair play, OK, it's an educational it. process. I, don't, really? I really don't even think they read it. They were just anti it. That's that. I mean, if you can get a question like, is there enough wind for solar? <laughs> You're still bitter about that, aren't you, Zoe? <laughs> all these years later. How much therapy I, have you paid for? I think he, um, I think he uh, was asleep and just woke up. Yeah. And <laughs> Okay, so is it, I can't believe it takes three or four months afterwards to get... What, what are they doing in that time period? <laughs> That's the oh, joy of the know. British planning. Right, anyway, look, you, we could be able to... But you finally get permission. That must have felt pretty amazing. Yeah, did, and then right. And then did you have people waiting, like tenants? Had you already gone out, you know, sort of saying, okay, this is what we want to do, we want people? Or, or did you then have to almost start from scratch and go, right, what are we, what are we going to do? Who's going to go on it? Well, we did have people, because the process took so long, they all... They'd all died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, they'd gone, look, I've given up on this. Mm. And they've been given opportunities as well. So we did yeah. have to start from scratch, pretty much. Okay. 
So you went out there and, and said, look, we, we can now... So you split these up generally into well, between we, three and five acres, something like that, is it, the plots? Or? Uh, those ones, the first ones were between... I think they were between five and nine okay. acres, but yeah, all small scale. And they, you know, since then we've got one um, flower herb business, one primarily salad, but they also, he also does sausages and has an orchard. Obviously that takes a while, the orchard part. Mm. And then the other one, it's a, it's a completely mixed farm, but they do a vegetable box scheme and they have a orchard right. and they 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 did try doing a micro dairy for a while okay. um, but that was financially just didn't work out yeah. so uh, did you in essence i'm going to say fill the plots basically did you let all the bits that you needed to reasonably quickly or i mean i i would say that finding people that really fit our model isn't straightforward mm. and you know since then we've even had some people what well, one person say that they love what we're doing but they are have reservations about being one of our stewards because they feel like they're in this spotlight right okay um because we are saying look at in a way aren't we we're saying you know this is a great thing that we're doing and mm. these are the benefits and people want to know about you and i mean our new tenants on our second site in sussex um were just on country file they right. were given an award by the Council of Protection of Rural England. They've only been there maybe nine months. And can you imagine, yeah. you know, you just sort of turn off and you're just getting going and I, then suddenly I, all these yeah. microphones are having, there. So. Having tried to grow something in my own garden and seeing the monumental failure, I can see how the pressure of people watching would be tricky. However, yeah. from a business perspective, what an amazing opportunity that is because... You know, if, if, if as a business person you don't want any exposure, maybe you're not cut out to be in business because you do need, fundamentally, you need a customer to buy whatever it is you're doing to make it sustainable, don't you? And that access to market and, and the support you guys, you know, can give with that spotlight and exposure, I suppose, shh, you would like to think fast tracks um, the opportunity to sell your produce to someone, I guess. I mean, I've not heard any of the stewards say that they've had problems establishing their market. That's good. I think that, yeah, there's there's other issues, but the market one... Yeah, <laughs> there's issues in the, <laughs> the fact that everything dies and the, and the caterpillars eat it, or this, uh, <laughs> based on my experience. So, okay, you get the you get the first one done, you get some uh, some people in there, it starts to have a success. How, how long between buying the first land and buying the, the next plot? I I think it was a couple of years, but now we have really sped up. Yeah. So now we're tr we've been buying bits of land at least once a year, maybe twice a year. And I think I read, did I, that you, you did, with the half a million you just raised, you want to get, was it another 18 plots in the next three years or something like that? So you, you really seem to have gathered some momentum now, is that fair? That's what we're aiming for. I mean, we definitely have sped up, um, but then also this year with COVID has slowed down the, uh, the, the, the part of it where we go from getting the land to getting the planning consent. So even though we've increased our team and we've increased the budget and we can buy more bits of land, we've actually found now that we've, we also sort of hit a bit of a wall with the planning committees not being able to to meet right. and the delays that that's caused but yeah we are we are speeding up but i mean i would say i would just say that it's you know it, what we're doing is is different in so many ways that we do take time to find our way mm. you know we are all cooperative um but you know we have we have a very different relationship with the stewards the stewards actually own 50 percent of the cooperative in terms of voting rights so is each one its own each plot its own cooperative or is this no overall? we're, we're okay, an overall yeah, cooperative overall. and then if you're a steward you um you have right to vote like all our members at the annual general meetings but but the stewards have 50 percent of voting rights so it's supposed to be their cooperative right because we and set the, it up for so them any, any, i say anybody but you've got a number of other in their investors in the essence investors in the cooperative. have their own membership category and they have 15 percent right. of the votes and okay. and then um i mean sorry 25 percent of the votes and then the stewards uh, the the workers like myself have the other 20 25 uh, percent okay. but um the issue with that is that on one hand it's great it's their ostensibly their cooperative on the other hand they feel that we're the directors or the staff and that they have a tenancy with us and there's still an element of a tenant landlord relationship and that's mm. what we've known in this country so trying to reinvent this mm. relationship where you have a body that owns the land and wants to have some oversight to make sure it stays in agroecological farming but on the other hand we want to empower them to feel like it's their cooperative that does we haven't quite got that to to work mm. um so that's one of the ne the areas that it's that's uh, that we are that we're discovering really, learning isn't it? Yeah, it sounds like every, yeah, everybody's learning together on that journey I suppose it can be tricky with all of these kind of um, 
things that you know got great intentions because the reality of of money and business and time and investment always creates complexity ultimately yes. doesn't yeah. it and yeah i can imagine if they're uh, on the land grafting you know doing the work and, and and seeing value increased i don't know you can start with great intentions but but money does funny things ultimately yeah. doesn't it so uh, yeah well, and also there's, there's no culture of something mm. there's there really isn't a culture of uh, a land's relationship like the one we have mm. then we also have to we also have to revisit the way we react to things don't we because it's we've learned to, to uh, from our relationships growing up around renting say mm. uh, about what we expect of landlords versus a tenant mm. but this is this is a slightly different model and uh but what, yeah, so th mm. that's that's an area of. Uh, so so as well as the help then in acquiring the land and then making sure that it's affordable and that they can spread the cost of that land, so they don't have to buy it all up front. They can rent it and they can rent it over a long enough period of time to make it affordable. You also get the temporary permission for hopefully five years for a dwelling. After that five years, you then need to sort of prove that you can then put what a permanent or semi-permanent dwelling. What what happens no, no, after permanent that? Dwelling. They permanent can, dwelling. They can build their own home at that point. Right, and we've. Our cooperative has its own criteria about the sustainability of the home, but otherwise, because um, I start off with a lot of them are living in in essence caravans or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So and 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 um, self sufficient in the fact they have got solar panels for the wind. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, don't hate me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but ultimately, then they they try and build in a house which is what on grid by this point. What you're talking about? A, a cabin or a, or a five bed farm thatched mansion worth a million pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm on the property you. market, it might be worth a million, <laughs> right? Things go crazy, but no, they, you know, that as you might expect, it's it, it's relative, it's as humble as we can, but we're being realistic. So we'd expect it to have enough space for a family in terms of bedrooms and a and a, an office for the for the farm business, but not much beyond that. Um, certainly no uh, yeah. <laughs> inside and hot tubs and yeah. marble kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> and if they then at some stage want to sell that oh, yes, you yeah. you in some way retain some control as to the fact that it needs to stay as a working ecological farm is that right yes they they have to let let us have six months to try and uh, buy back off them i mean ideally we'd, we'd buy it back off them quicker than that obviously because most people want to know what they're doing right. um but yeah we have the first right to buy but even if we don't buy it off them they have to find somebody to buy it from them who will also be an agricultural worker hmm. and has that happened yet because nobody i suppose no. wants to, to do this for their whole lives or do they is everybody so far as i suppose you're relatively early in, yeah. in the journey have you got dwellings that have been built yeah no no so you've not quite got to that five year but that's but that's oh, we have, yeah we have got to the five year on the first site but um but they just haven't yet built their homes okay you think they will yes i think they will yeah yeah exciting isn't it i love it i think it's brilliant um okay and then you're also helping so now we've got land we've got somewhere to live presumably sometimes they either need just some learning so access to advice on i'm guessing the business side of it so you know is it like it was interesting actually when you said you need maybe three acres minimum to start with because when i interview hoteliers i'm always asking like, how many hotel rooms do you need for a viable business and they yeah. say about 30 so you've obviously got a lot of knowledge i guess around the sort of stuff to farm i guess there's no point just growing potatoes and carrots and cheap crops there's no point doing it on on one acre so it is is, is, is a lot of what you offer also this sort of this wealth of experience now and, and business acumen and I mean, we certainly be better than when we started, but there's still so much more that we could know. And I would like to see our cooperative bring in more expertise on, on developing uh, agroecological farm businesses. Um, you're right about the potatoes, you know, for sure we've learned that over the years. That, you know, you, if someone came to us and said, I want to just grow potatoes on three acres and look, I'm going to make 20,000 a year, we would say, uh, <laughs> I mean, I know that much, uh, yeah. but I would still, we would still get, even I know that much, just yeah, in my garden, yeah, I have yeah. a lot of potatoes. See, I've still got them in a sack, uh, I mean, in the people, shed. People don't really even grow potatoes hardly on the box schemes no. because, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to buy in that because it's just, yeah. they can't make money out of it, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so so what, what the best, the, the, of the businesses that have come in, what have you seen that I suppose is, is doing the best? Because it seems to be that the closer you can get either to the end product or to the 
consumer. So for, I'm thinking like dairy farms that I've spoken to and interviewed, for example, no longer making money necessarily out of the milk, but if they can start to make ice cream and they can make yogurts and they can go to the next stage, they can sort of add value, I suppose, by getting further down the chain. Are you are you are you seeing that, or is it are you still mainly raw ingredients? I think was there a herbalist or something? No, no, no always the added value, like like you said, is is always really what they have to consider i mean very few of them sell wholesale um most of them pretty much all of them will have direct links with customers veg box uh, type links or you know we've got one new steward who's doing edible flowers for hopefully for restaurants but obviously with covid they've had to slightly revise their business plan and that will be directly selling to restaurants um yeah people people providing directly to the local local shops or yeah selling directly to customers through websites for example or mm. with the herbalist she'll use her herbs in her herbal practice and then she can sell them at the retail cost mm. to the to her clients yeah so i think it must be difficult uh, if you took potatoes as a, as a as an example no value in the potatoes but if you'll uh, can turn them into a vodka or into a crisp then that's where you add value but presumably as thus far you, you don't really want to get into the manufacturing side i suppose or going back to that dairy farmer you, you mentioned a micro dairy i suppose if they could have then set up somewhere on site that was that actually turned into ice cream but i guess at this point you're starting to put you know industrial units i suppose on on farms which is counterproductive is it i'd say there's the 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 capital costs mm. which might be a barrier yeah. There's also the planning issue. So yeah. if you've got an additional building for processing to to milk, uh, I mean, to, sorry, to ice cream, then then obviously you're going to need some yeah. extra storage space. There's also the the uh, energy issue. Yeah. So if we're off grid, <laughs> and they don't all have to be off grid. You know, other ones that we create in the future could be connected to the grid. But if they are off grid, then then the farmers are limited mm. in terms of what what they can power. Yeah. Okay. So focusing on good quality produce and getting it to as close to the consumer as possible. Uh, is probably key at this stage. That's where you're seeing the success, basically. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Um, I'm trying to think what else you do. So, yeah, I suppose it, the next bit then is is finding the tenants. And you, you touched on this, that it can be challenging because you've got quite a specific criteria, I suppose, around it being an ecological uh, approach to farming and relatively small scale. With this with this growth, you've now got some investment behind you and you're trying to find more plots how, and you're getting more exposure. And if you were on country file, that mass might help. Um, are you, have you, is there a significant demand, I suppose, for tenants? And uh, what's that application process like, I suppose? Is it, is it quite intensive and how long? I, I'm, <laughs> this is, this is like 97 questions in this one question, Zoe. But I would imagine there's a fair bit of interest. When, but when people actually look at the detail and, and try and make the numbers work and, and realistically look at it, there must be an attrition rate of people who go actually Actually, that's not for me. So can you just talk a little bit, I suppose, about acquiring those stewards? Did I get the right word? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is probably one of the hardest areas to talk about. Yeah. I haven't been myself involved in, in the recruitment process recently because of my different role at the ELC. Um, but what has happened at, at the ELC over the years is that we, rather than saying, hey, now we've got a farm, apply, We've said at any point contact us and let's ha start having a discussion and looking at ways to signpost people if they're at the stage which isn't quite uh, they're they're not quite ready to take on a holding. Um, we can say, well, actually, why don't you think about interning at this farm over here um, or getting this doing this course or getting a little bit more experience. Uh, but mainly having that discussion over a period of time for us to all get to know each other, because actually it is a really long-term relationship. I mean, potentially for the rest of our lives, we might all be knowing each other in, you know, as this, in this cooperative. So that's, that's the direction that we've gone in. And we've also tried to look at what options there are in terms of mentoring for when people are, are selected. And we're learning things like if we are going to have three small holdings on one bit of land and people are going to share, for example, the solar system, that actually what we do need to think about set, helping them set up systems to discuss, to discuss shared resources. Because that's not, again, that's not really part of our culture. And a lot of people are quite adverse to raising problems that they then have with their neighbours. And if these people are going to be there for a long time together, we really want to support them to have a good relationship. 
um, and that we really are learning uh, still. Very, mm. uh, we, I feel very young on that. Yeah, that, it's, it's uh, complex, area. isn't it? Um, but that's the thing that we really need to try and work on is is how do we create the almost like we almost. It's not an intentional community because they have their own bit of land and they have their own homes, but they do share a bit of infrastructure. So in a way, it is a bit like an intentional community. And then how do we make sure that we're giving them the best possible chance to to be able to thrive in that setting and not not create conflicts for them? So one thing we've learned is actually it's not a great idea to have a solar system with one meter because then you can fight. Well, you used mm. loads more electricity than yeah. me. You know, All like, of a sudden, say, somebody's charging their Tesla. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh, you know it seems like a no-brainer right yeah. when you when i say it now well, yeah. of course everybody needs their own meter because the energy that they get is free to use in the sense that the solar panels are paid for when they move in right as part of the whole package yeah uh but actually they need meters not to know so that they can pay but just so that they so can so that it's fair mm. so, you know those sort of things you know mm. sort of you could say we've made some rudimental errors but you know yeah le- learning as you go yeah. and then again as you as a, you've got more success and you can demonstrate that the model does work are you starting to get farm i'm thinking of acquiring the land as the other aspect i suppose are you getting farmers who actually go you know what i'm happy to i mean ideal scenario i suppose is that they donate some land or, or at least be willing to sell it to you at, at less than commercial rates because they do have this slightly philanthropic sort of uh, idea to to reinvest and to see uh, you know land better managed is, is, is that happening or is that my unrealistic la la land of thinking everybody's lovely I think there are some really lovely people out there, and we we have had um, it's it, it's still early days, but we have had a, 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 a one farm left to us in in somebody's will, which is incredible. Amazing. That's first. Yeah. Um, so that would be very significant to us because even though we're doing relatively well in terms of raising finance and buying land and getting people on, it's still a marginal business. Yeah. Um, so that would that will help by by bringing in a farm we can rent out and having some ongoing income that's uh, that's secure um we do get a lot of people wanting us to to monitor their sites for them or to help them find someone to manage their land but okay. we don't tend to get people who want to sell it at a lower rate sometimes people will be happy to give us tenancies but they tend not to be long enough for us to work right. for us almost like an agency where you can kind of you've got access to the small holders and the, and the tenants that want to do it they've got the land you become a middleman but your objective would be yeah to provide long-term security you'd rather own the land yeah or have a really long lease which is not impossible mm. but we just haven't had anything like that come up yet right okay yeah interesting isn't it? i think um and then when, when you do acquire that land, I guess your, your first example where it took a very long time to get planning now with that experience, do you tend to, if, if an opportunity to come to get land comes up... You know, you know what the answer's going to be. <laughs> well, but do you know what the question's going to be? I think so. Has it gotten easier? <laughs> yeah, has it gotten easier? And, and now do you kind of, do you, do you make decisions, you know, do you not necessarily buy the plot with, with no idea, but would you actually go, okay, we've got bugger all chance of getting permission on that one, but there's more chance of getting on that one for, through that learning? Yeah, can you can you speed up that process a little bit yeah well we definitely got a little bit more knowledgeable about the places that were more or less likely to get planning permission the thing that i didn't realize when i first started is planning permission is not a yes or no it, it, it's a it, it can be a no 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 yes because over time planning policy changes so it's more about how long are you ready to wait and what impact will that have on your business if you buy a bit of land and you have to wait or you have to go through various different applications and uh, appeals and so forth. I mean, it's not to say that you would always get it on every bit of land if you persisted long enough. I, I'm not saying that, but it's also not just a black and white. You can and you can't. It's it's planning is a movable thing. Planning policies change. Um, but I did, um, I, I was advised by a very good planning consultant uh, that, that continues to advise us that well once we got our first permission that'll be easy and we'll just go to a council and we'll walk in and they'll go yeah and they'll say thank you for coming we're so pleased you arrived oh, right. we really hoped you'd rock up no uh, no <laughs> <laughs> ah, damn so uh, instead the the second site that we approached a council to get planning permission for they um they uh well i made an appointment like you do you know months in advance you've got to pay hundreds of pounds to have the pleasure of getting their advice yeah. uh, the day before 
that was supposed to have a meeting, the planning officer rings up and leaves a message on my voice mail that says, don't bother coming in, it's a non-starter. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> So I had to call him up and said, yeah, say, please, 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 like, can we come in? Um, you know, he said, well, I'll refund you and everything. But I'm like, no, I don't want to be refunded. I've waited months to come talk to you. <laughs> Plus, you'd already uh, bought the lamb, presumably. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Love it. And, uh, and then he meets us in the foyer. This is obviously way before COVID, so it's not any reason. Like, so we're paying him hundreds of pounds and we're meeting him in the, in the foyer. And he kind of listens a little bit and then writes a letter back saying this is a like, non-starter. No. <laughs> It's outrageous. Isn't it? <laughs> it really is. You're, I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I don't do the planning applications anymore. I don't so blame you. I've left. had my own experience of planning. And that's, you know, when I, arguably they'd come at it from a business perspective, although I would argue that hospitality is the fabric of society and creating bars and restaurants and for places for people to hang out. And that, that's yeah. a whole other story. But in this situation, oh, yeah, frustrating. OK. Yeah, did, did, have you won that one yet? Yeah, that one, um, we took it to appeal. And a week before the appeal... They, um, they gave us permission. Time period from him saying no in the foyer to you getting permission? About 18 months. 18 months. Thousands, tens of thousands of pounds, oh, presumably. Definitely thousands of pounds, as we actually at that point had a planning <sighs> consultant that was very good. Oh, man. Doing the work for us. Bonkers, isn't it? So, you know, I, I, I love it for, for lots of reasons. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's going to make the world better and the environment better. And I think we all need to learn. But, but clearly you know this isn't going to um be big enough on its own to to change you know the planet and the direction of the planet what do you think that can see sorry to, <laughs> to break saying, that Mark? to you <laughs> I, I hope you've got your head around that sorry and you haven't come in i've just broken i've just broken the news Pass to me you the of tissues. yeah yeah um so what you know what what we need is consumers as well you know you can partly lead it with what you're doing and it's a brilliant it's a brilliant initiative but we need consumers to make some changes so what what do you think that that the public need to be doing um you know because i guess you know part of it is just knowing where our food and drink comes from and and, and asking a few more questions but to fast track this sort of uh, you know if you look at your objectives i suppose around being you know better soil better land management better social all, all that kind of stuff what would you ask the public to do to make that a, f a faster process, I suppose? Well, in the first instance, to look to see if they've got like a local organic vegetable pot scheme. If they don't have one, see if they could be part of starting up a community supported agricultural scheme. So that would mean, I mean, there's, there's, little, there's loads of support for doing something like that. It would mean getting enough people together to, to, to form a small group and rent some land or buy some land locally. And, um, and create their own vegetable box scheme, so at least that they, they were act, they were getting their fruit and vegetables produced in a sustainable way. They would have a local connection as well, and all that that brings in terms of understanding how their food is produced. And I think also, you know, we all need to have nature in our lives. You know, we are all so much happier. I think if we we have that connection, and maybe we don't talk about that enough. Um, so, you know, I, I would encourage people to, to do it for, for that reason as well, to, that actually it will really enrich their lives and they'll feel also maybe a little less trapped. I feel like, you know, I was reading this book the other day about access to land in England and we apparently only have access to 8% of land in England. Uh, and that includes rights of way and bridleways. And I think by connecting to your local farm it will also help you feel or help us feel that we have a little little more access to, to to our countryside and I think that will help us feel a little better about our country maybe that's a little bold statement there but no I think I think the number of people listening who would who would then have the time to go off and uh, yeah get a group of people together and start growing their own vegetables will be more limited but the number of people who could actually you know get involved with existing schemes or just just you know get out in nature and care about nature more isn't it and, and plant a tree it's like the uh, honeybee thing isn't it is that the answer to the to the bee problem isn't about you know more beehives and putting bees in your garden it's just plant some flowers you know there's plenty of bees out there basically we just need to make sure that they've got the food and it's not about the honeybees anyway it's about all the other types of pollinating kind of insects and stuff like that so the easiest thing they can do actually i think people in their heads think oh my god i need to get a beehive and create some bees and actually go you know just just plant some flowers uh, so the easier we make it for people, I suppose, 
the better. Is, is it likely that there are a lot of local schemes running anyway? Because you're you're not the only charity in this space. You, you're, you're doing something fairly unique in the, in the sort of long term land management perspective. But actually trying to get people interested in the outdoors and in land and in the environment. You know, is it likely that there is somewhere locally and is there somewhere where people should go to kind of find out, I suppose, about what what sort of stuff is happening in the community that they can get involved with? I do find that a hard question to answer. Mm. I don't. It's like. I don't think it is that easy just to go to a, a single website, for example, to find, you know, what, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, immediately what comes to mind is that there are things like <laughs> the wildlife trusts um, and there are things like Sword Association where you can look up what your local veg- what scheme is right. or you could... Um, you could Google around and, or sorry, search around the internet and... Um, and Duck, Duck, Go, isn't it? Which one's the one that plants a tree? Is it that one? Well, you can't Google it, can you? <laughs> That's uh, too big a corporate. And, uh, and you probably, you know, you probably can find, a, 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 you know, have a little look. The other place that you might look is the Open Food Network, which is uh, an interesting new platform, right. which allows a number of small farmers to, to club together and sell through... Uh, a single platform so as the consumer you go on and you can buy whatever you want your meat and your vegetables and stuff from various different like, small farms but it gets delivered to you or to a pickup spot okay so you don't have to go to each farm open food that no, sounds good it's the same in restaurants because you know as a restaurateur i've got a desire and i'm sure lots of people listening to this lots of people just interested in food and drink in general but there's also lots of people who work in hospitality and one of the challenges around restaurants and buying organic can be price, but it can also just be access. You know, we, we you probably do you can't buy independently, you know, directly from the small consumers necessarily, unless they've got some sort of delivery infrastructure. They almost inevitably have to kind of you know get together and you know become some sort of co-op because it is about that route to market. Um, I mean, I would love it you, you, if, if you had some land locally and a number of small scale farmers who could then, you know, join together. I, I would I guess I, the point would be, I, I think the demand is there. I'm sure there'd be lots of hospitality businesses who would like to buy, but at the moment don't know where to buy from. Any any experience around that, I suppose, and where, you know, the commercial sector should go to try and purchase from? Because it seems hard uh, to buy. Well, that's that's, that's really providers. interesting because the growers that I um, have provided some guidance for, for the Land Workers Alliance, they're asking the same question. How do we connect with yeah, the uh, restaurateurs? The yeah, exactly. um, how do we yeah. work with them? What are their needs? Mm. You know, Are they looking for certain cuts in meat? Are they looking for certain quality in terms of produce? Can they Are they happy with the wonky fruit? Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't know either, so maybe... <laughs> There's Maybe there's an opportunity there. Forces here, Zoe. This is the future, which is why we wanted to have. I wanted to have a conversation with you anyway, because I think there yeah, there is a, a genuine opportunity. But uh, it's going to be fascinating, isn't it? If we can join the dots better, one of the challenges around hospitality can be the, the the volume that's required. So if you touched on meat, for example, it can be really difficult because you know a, a different types of restaurants will, will require different cuts of meat, um, and there's a limited number of fillets that you're going to get from a cow, and it's no good if you're you know if you're a cow farmer and and all of your premium cuts go to one restaurant and then you're left with all the other bits so a really good you know restaurant will try and use uh, the whole kind of carcass approach um and that can be very helpful but yeah it's having all of those conversations basically i suppose and joining joining the dots but then also you know the, the number of tomatoes that a busy restaurant you know will get through may well be beyond you know what one small scale scale pr- pr- producer can can provide and also they, they might require a very different amount in august than they do in february because august particularly in seaside towns around the country is phenomenally busy february's different so there's some complexities around I suppose, smoothing out the peaks and troughs of demand which might be yes. difficult but clearly there's a conversation to be yes. had because it would be you know incredibly exciting to yeah, to join the dots on that, wouldn't it? And I don't think there is any organisation that represents restaurateurs who want to source more ethically or sustainably. I, no. I don't know of any. No, but there's definitely a lot of restaurants who, who do do it already. I mean, yes. that's not, it's yeah, not to yeah. say that it's impossible because a lot of restaurants do work directly with suppliers, but those suppliers have probably got to a scale where at least they've got a van or, or I buy from some middlemen who I know do go round to you know to the comparative small holdings of the New Forest, for example, and buy produce. So yeah, there are some informal alliances already and there's some very motivated restaurants. But on both sides, the easier it is for the producer and the easier it is for the restaurant, the more chance of it of it being the uh, the norm, I suppose, rather than the exception, isn't it? 
Yes. Which is key. You're right. That is a yes or no answer. <laughs> um, so, so, so talking about uh, you know just touching on the future, we're, we're drawing to a close because we're we're getting very short on time. But um, are you are you sort of uh, are you optimistic? I suppose because the, the the big picture is is this sort of you know this continual growth in monoculture. We've got a lot of stuff going on at the moment with negotiations coming out of the EU and starting to negotiate with the US, I suppose, and the agricultural bill and all that kind of stuff. So when I was chatting to Guy Watson, I suppose, he, he had said, Let's, in some ways, it's getting worse and better at the same time because it looks like the big stuff is getting worse, but in many ways we are learning so much more about this sort of restorative farming and all that kind of stuff. What's your view on the future? Are you pessimistic or optimistic? Just on farming or generally? Uh, <laughs> it does in the COVID. Yeah, on, on farming food and drink, I suppose. Or, or environment, I suppose. Not just on your own. Uh, like not whether you're going to be able to pay off your mortgage this year, Zoe. Which just, one was that? <laughs> not, if gonna... not if you're going to be able to pay off your mortgage this year. So, yeah, less, <laughs> less about your own personal circumstance, but more around, yeah, environment and food and the planet. I think I'm, I'm quite positive on food because I think we are learning so much aren't yeah. we um you know th- like the soils the all the new research that's coming about soils and understanding the importance of soil life and just having better understanding what's going on down there and and how that affects our our, our health um so we're beginning to understand the importance of our stomach bacteria aren't we in a way that we hadn't really understood before and that could really you could really we could really see a change in the way that we eat once people um, learn about that because they think, okay, wow, it's not just it's not just what I what I eat in the sense of, you know, am I eating a healthy diet or not? But is it actually helping my bacteria because that will really affect my overall health and longevity? So that that feels really exciting, and we are you know we are seeing some really interesting new things happening in farming in terms of like you're saying the the regenerative farming and uh, the no till and the minimum till and understanding that the impact has for carbon. Um, and also just, you know, I think we are acting more on on dealing with climate change and, and we're able to be energised by that as a sector. Um, but on the bigger picture, if I'm honest, I do think, I think we've got, a, you know, I, I do worry about our ability to mobilise on the wider picture in a time frame that really matters or, you know, in terms of... of uh, stopping the worst of the the habitat loss globally for example or the the destruction of the oceans but you know i'm not a i'm not a scientist so this is just based on on my own personal reading and Mm. and so on Mm. yeah it's interesting isn't it because we you know yeah there's definitely a problem isn't it we definitely need to work out as humanity how to how to fix it i share I share the pessimism and optimism uh, in equal measure, I suppose. A lot, a lot of it has got to be knowledge, and I think there's an increasing number of people that do know. But then I just look at, you know, even my own family's, you know, consumption and through ease of things like Amazon and how easy it is just to buy stuff and have it delivered, you know, the next day. And that makes me worry about, yeah, the overconsumption of humanity, I suppose. And, and that's one of the key things we need to resolve, I think, isn't it? Yes. Consume yeah. less uh, and consume better, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I saw Patagonia, for example, one of your sponsors, and I love them as a brand and their sort of ethos and ethics, I suppose, environmentally. And uh, are you getting many um, companies with a shared vision, I suppose, starting to, to, to get involved? And, it, and is it helpful when people like Patagonia come along and, and sponsor you? Yeah, I mean, any kind of grant support is so welcome because it just takes the pressure off, as you can imagine, us proving this business model. And... Um, and also we can pass support on to our stewards, which is wonderful. So that's whenever we can pass grants onto them, we're really happy. Um, yes, the answer is yes, we're always really happy to do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously we, we've got to have some sort of criteria if someone comes along and says, so if Shell came along and said, oh, we would like to support you, then we probably would say no. Um, or, you know, we would certainly have a very in-depth conversation. <laughs> It'd be like this podcast being sponsored by Weatherspoon, Zoe. It'd be a certain irony, <laughs> wouldn't there, if, yeah. <laughs> if we sold out? I'm open for... No, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not yeah, open yeah, for yeah. a chat. Am I? Oh, I don't think I am. No, no. no. So, yeah, it's, it's, it can be difficult, I suppose, can't it? But, but yeah. Okay, um, brilliant. You know, I, I love the story. I, incidentally, before we stop, your role now then as policy campaigner, so that's your specific title uh was was i close is that right well it's not that it's just that's on the website but in reality that's <laughs> recently i haven't really been doing that okay. i've been uh, i've been pre- helping the this union with their yeah. publications to support 
um, to support farmers. Um, so more like guidance, like guidance on finance and fundraising and guidance on direct marketing. So it's it's not really been on policy recently. It's just okay. we haven't updated the website. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, okay, so that's your current focus. Are you enjoying that? Well, I'm learning a lot. I really support the Land Workers Alliance, but it's a little tough being just at home on the computer. I'm missing the uh, teamwork yeah. um, and the connection and the conversations and being out in the world and being on the farms. Well, isn't it lucky that we brought you out into the world today, Zoe, so we can actually yeah, have a proper conversation yeah, face a proper to face. Coffee. Yeah, almost the last opportunity. We're getting locked down again. In well, this will date this because by the time this podcast goes out, we will be in the midst, I imagine, of another lockdown. But we're seventy-two hours away, or whatever it is. Um, but look, thank you for sparing the time and thanks for coming to join me. And it's the first thank podcast you. I've recorded at the hotel. Actually, I've done a few down on my seafront restaurant, but it's uh, nice to do. And apologies for anybody hearing all the creaking and crackling noises because we're sort of under an awning, I suppose, in some regards. I mean, a posh awning, and uh, and it's been a little bit windy. Um, if people want to find find out more than either about um, you personally although you're quite hard to track down because I charged, tried in the last 24 hours but but the ELC and all of the various uh, alliances you work with where's the best place to go what's the best website for people to go to or social media I mean if they could go to the, the ecological land cooperatives website or the land workers alliance website both of those have got a whole bunch of resources the land workers alliance have got dozens of free publications um, really, really well done. Some of them by me. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Um, and then, you know, if they really are, if there's a few listeners interested in this community-supported agriculture idea, if that if that's something that they think they may be interested in in seeing in their area, then this it's called the CSA network, the Community Supported Agriculture Network. Okay. Uh, good people to to contact. They're, they're well, very if, good. If you, if you can send me the links to these various sites that you've mentioned, if possible, and then I'll make sure that they they're all put up on the show notes with this podcast as well on the website. So that would be uh, that would be super helpful. Um, but yeah, good luck in in continuing the quest. I suppose, like I say, I think it's uh, brilliant. I wish you the best of luck. And uh, can you can you do one locally? Any plans to do one? Uh, we would love it. to do one locally uh, and we were invited by the the new council here that you've got what is it bcp bournemouth, bournemouth christchurch pool yeah. um to to uh input on their their new local plan which they want to have includes local food production so yeah okay. there's one to watch yeah and i, I chair a charity uh, bournemouth parts foundation which looks after all the sort of public and, and open spaces and green sort of spaces i suppose uh, in the conurbation as well and i'm sure you know, they've certainly got plenty of land, so there must be an opportunity. So uh, we'll keep oh, in touch, yes, and hopefully we can create one. That would be amazing. Thanks, uh, thank you, Zoe. You are you are free to go back to Lewis and not enjoy your wonderful firework display. I'm sorry. <laughs> Right, congratulations, you have made it to the end of another episode. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, don't forget, if you want to find any of those websites, links, movies that Zoe and I chatted about, do head over to the website humansofhospitality.co.uk. Uh, if you can also do me a favour and go to your podcast player of choice and hit the subscribe button, that's incredibly helpful if you can leave a review even better. Uh, really helps me out to demonstrate to other potential guests uh, how many people are listening, so that would be hugely appreciated i will be back next monday with another show and we are going all the way to scotland actually right to the northwest of scotland next week where we are chatting to dan from the uh, the torridon hotel which is a beautiful place in a beautiful part of the country so uh, yeah really good conversation with dan uh, i hope you can join me uh yeah catch up again in a week cheers <laughs>